Hello, I'm Joe Vito with American Songwriter, and today we're on Nashville's legendary music row with a legendary songwriter, J.D. Souther. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. It's so great to have you here today, um, especially after uh, the crazy year that um, the world just kind of went through. What was 2020 like for you? When did the pandemic kind of start for you? For musicians, it was incredibly obvious. They just stopped being in gigs. I think uh, the last thing I played on the road was March of last year, February. So 17 months of no work is pretty weird for a musician. Were you writing at all? Uh, kind of I wish I could say I was writing at all. I, I thought really hard about doing some live stream stuff. And I, I watched a few, and some that were done really well. A couple from the caverns that were done really well down here, but that was pretty big time. But most of the stuff that came from people's houses, I just thought, I, I don't think I'm at my best. How has it kind of felt to come back to performing music with others in that we'll kind see. of setting? The two that I did by, uh, before, I did by myself. Oh, okay, yeah. Which is what my usual thing is. It's a one-man show, but it goes on for a long time. There's a break in the middle, and then I go on and on. So I just thought the trio's in town. My bass player lives in Brazil now, and he's here for the summer. Chris, the piano player, was off, and I said, look, I don't care if I make any money. Let's just put together a great... We've always wanted to play all these standards. We keep peppering, like, the set of my songs with, like, a Duke Ellington song here, and a Mose Allison song here, and a Hank Williams song here, and a Cole Porter song here. Just pop them in. I thought, what if we just do a whole, a whole night of stuff like that? And then instead, just pop in a few of my hits, because I'm old enough. They're standards, too, you know? On that note, what can you tell us kind of about um, your, like, really early childhood with exploring all those different sounds and kind of how you thought about them, and then obviously now um, through the work that you did, like, in 2015 with tenderness and all of that. I was a lonely child. <laughs> and your friend was music? I had records, and uh, my dad was on the road with a big band most of the time, so I was home with my mom and my his mother, my father's mother, the opera singer, Eugenie, who was from Boston, and sort of talked like that. And uh, they just they didn't have anything to do. None of us had anything to do. And there were no kids on my either block in Detroit or Cleveland where I moved after that. And so I just had music. Today that you've mentioned uh, a couple of really amazing people that you've gotten the chance to collaborate with, what can you tell us about kind of the collaboration process and kind of how that comes together and how working with another artist can really kind of augment what you're working on? It makes it go faster. It's the greatest advantage of collaboration is you finish the song. And if you get really lucky, which I have a couple of times, everybody doesn't get the good fortune of collaborating with Don Henley and Glenn Fry and Warren Zevon and Waddy Wachtel. <laughs> Bert Bacharach and I wrote two songs. And I thought, boy, how is this ever going to work? And it was just smooth as it can be. It was great. And I know that I saw an interview with you, um, I believe from 2014, where you were talking about kind of the democratization of the music industry in uh, the era of streaming, in the era of uh, home recording and all the things that have happened. And so I just wanted to see, that was a few years ago now, what you kind of think of the industry now, and especially with less like streaming. Less. <laughs> Say more. The year I put out my first album, there were, um, I think Mo, Mo Austin told me this, there were 15,000 albums put out. And, and that was 1971. And in 2011, there were 115,000 albums put out. So they can't possibly all be good, you know. It's, there's a lot of room for experimentation, and out of it grow sometimes these beautiful, uh, like a nexus of influences that works really well. Like who would have thought Minneapolis was gonna be a hub of music until Prince, you know? A song that I wrote with Don and Glenn called Best of My Love was not the first single from that album. It was, in fact, we had another single that was sort of chuffing along mid-charts. And uh, a radio station in Minneapolis started playing that all the time. Just playing it all the time. Started getting phone calls, started playing it more. Somebody did an edit on the end of it because they said, well, you're never going to have a hit single that's four and a half minutes long with no drums and steel guitar on it. That just doesn't happen. And Henley and I, at all along, we going, yes, it does. Yes. It's hard in the, in the sense that it's hard to uh, sort of echolocate an audience. It's easy in the sense that with just a little bit of study, you can do it. If you've got a microphone and a laptop and some instruments, you can make a record. 
Yeah, well, on that note, kind of just one last wrap-up question for you, which is between those shows you have coming up, between all this music that you're kind of working on, and between just the state of the world today, how do you feel? What's the future look like for you? The world looks okay to me. I'm, I'm not neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I, I believe things happen and we deal with them. We either do, deal with them well, and it takes longer for them to work out right, or we deal with them <laughs> poorly and they don't work out right at all. We have to kind of start over and enter from another place. How's the future look for J.D. Souther? Oh, so bright. I gotta wear shades. You heard it here, folks. The future is looking so bright. We got J.D. Souther here. I'm Joe Vito for American Songwriter. Thank you so much for tuning in.